All right, so I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Zara Shakari for our next lecture, which will be on how to create high quality plots and graphs. This is certainly a uh, critical part of the research process and one that I am so surprised that most researchers, including myself, do not receive formal training in before we uh, are actually doing the paper and have to figure out how to put together high quality figures. So I'm really looking forward to this talk and expecting it to be useful to many. So thanks, Sarah, and I'll let you take over. Hey, thank you so much, Pranav, for the introduction. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yeah, I assume the answer is yes. Okay. So um, thanks everyone for joining um, this presentation today. I really enjoyed uh, the few last presentation that they could attend um, today. Um, and um, I mean, the, for the next hour will be like a more colorful hour because we will have lots of colors charts in this talk. But um, uh, there is there is a very uh, concrete mapping between this presentation and the other qualitative quantitative presentations or lectures that we had in the last few hours. And for sure, the presentations from yesterday, which I unfortunately couldn't um, attend due to uh, conflicting schedule. So my name is Zara. Um, I'm, I was uh, with Harvard Medical School until July 2022, 20, and I recently started my new position as an assistant prof at the University of Toronto. Uh, my position with Harvard University was mostly related to information visualizations using health data, EHR data sets, and uh, in a broader scope, uh, data visualizations for health informatics, including machine learning and AI using health data. So um, the main learning outcome of this presentation would be a broad picture of visualization techniques, visual variables that we will need to consider when it comes to uh, visualizing quantitative data, qualitative data, and um, getting familiar with visual encodings, which are the core components of whatever visualization types that we use or present in our manuscripts or in our, um, like, um, let's say, um, whatever communication media that we use to communicate our message to our end users or the audience of our work. And we would also go through some common visualization mistakes that will lead to misinformation. And um, these are very common uh, mistakes. We will see uh, some interesting numbers about the volume of mistakes that are currently available in scientific publications. And uh, we may not have time to go through all of these um, like um, mistakes or the techniques that can improve these mistakes one by one, but we will address the most frequent ones. And uh, there are references that you can for sure go through and read more about um, like the other um, minor mistakes or other uh, mistakes that we cannot cover in this presentation due to the time constraint. So a recent publication that analyzed visual information in scientific literature uh, found 4.8 million figures from more than 650K uh, papers on PubMed. And if we divide this number by the number of papers, we have seven, almost seven and a half figures per paper. And the other publication that specifically looked at medical figures in scientific publications, they found that 60% of these graphs um, have charts junk, they have distortion and readability issues or visual clarity. So it's more than half of the figures uh, that researchers present in uh, their scientific manuscripts to communicate the takeaway of their work um, are, um, I mean, they will need improvements at least to, to be um, to better present uh, the main findings or the main messages of uh, a research work. So there are tons of visualization techniques. There are lots of nice, interesting, uh, fancy visualization techniques out there. 
Um, these are some of the techniques that we will go through today, but uh, we for sure we cannot go through all of them. Some of them are very critical, basic, that we see a lot in um, scientific publications. But um, if we have time, I will go through um, like some of these visualizations just by um, explaining the visual variables. Uh, but uh, definitely we'll go through some of these techniques uh, by detail. So the greatest value of the picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. Um, a very good example, this, this is statistical data set, um, like the uh, quarter data set that has includes four different um, data, or let's say data points, um, X and Y. And if we just ignore the, the bottom table, and if I ask you what's the difference between um, these data sets, you might quickly start calculating the mean and uh, the general statistics uh, parameters of this data set. So let's just go one step further and calculate all of these parameters, and we'll see that the regression model that present um, all of these data sets is exactly the same or is identical. We have y is equal to three plus points times x. So we might just come quickly come end up with this conclusion that all of these have almost the same distribution and they will fit the same line. But if we visualize the data, we will see that uh, these four subsets of the data set are presenting different distributions. And there are some outliers in one of uh, some of these data sets. One of them has a very clean pattern that might tell a story about the data. So sometimes graphics visualizations can be more precise and revealing than conventional statistical computations. And a cool example that I found a couple of years ago on Twitter is this nice uh, radar chart that presents um, the patterns that we see in um, number of tweets posted by different Twitter handles. And the main purpose of this visualization is exploring or detecting tweet bots. Um, if, if you just look at the numbers and, or let's say the temporal data that we have for um, each of these users, we might not be able to come up with this conclusion, quick, quick conclusion that, oh yeah, these are the, the bots that we have. Um, or these are the accounts that are not real users. So these are some good examples that show how visualization can reveal a message or a concept that might be hard to communicate using just numbers and um, like um, a statistical concepts. So let's just start with the main concepts that we will repeat a lot today in this uh, lecture, visual variables or visual encodings. There are, if you check the literature or um, like the internet, there will be lots of other visual encodings of visual available, visual variables out there, but these are the core ones that we need to be familiar with when it comes to um, visualizing the results of our research or regardless of the type of the data. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's quantitative data or just pure, pure qualitative data. So we can not just go with, um, like having the data and selecting a chart and uh, making something super, super beautiful, putting this in our uh, manuscript paper and uh, just hope that everyone will understand the message or the main takeaway of our research. Variables are important. Each of them has a specific um, application context. Sometimes we can combine these variables in case we have more concepts to communicate, but uh, in most cases, we select visual variables based on, sorry, visual, visualization techniques based on the best visual variables that can present our data. So we have position that mainly presents X and Y locations um, of the data. We have direction, slope, or angle that uh, presents changes in the direction of the data, or we use direction dynamics of direction to present a message or show a pattern in our data set. We have color and saturation. Both are mostly related to color selection. Um, the color itself, uh, 
usually shows changes in hue. We use color to show diversity and saturation usually shows the value of the color. We will go through the details of these shortly. And we also have size. We, we talk about size when we use line chart, area chart. When we talk about the length or area of the visual component that we are using to present our data. So these are some quick, quick examples of um, visualization techniques. They're using these visual variables and putting this here to show you what we mean by visual variables. For example, in the area chart, which is a line chart with field area, uh, we are using length. We are in this specific um, like structure, we are seeing different colors that presenting different categories of data, or we're seeing length or size that's showing uh, the uh, value or the magnitude of the value of um, our data set. So we have bubble chart, uh, another visualization technique that's mainly used to show mapping between categorical data. We can use different visual variables here. For example, we're using size, we're using the coordinate or position, and we're also using the transparency variable to show three different concepts here. So one can just show the value of one concept, the other variable can show um, the value of another variable that you have in your data set and the mapping or the position also is showing um, like the mapping between or the co-occurrence of categorical variables that you have in your data set. And same with the line chart, uh, we have here, we are using the direction or slope or angle to show a pattern in our data, which is like increasing or decreasing pattern. Uh, we're using visual encode, another visual encoding, which is color here to show different categories. So, so it's important to know that there are variables that we need to consider. For example, for this line chart here, if there are not more than one, um, there's, there's no more than one category here, or if you're just showing um, or the stress of the message that you're communicating is not on the categories, you don't need to go with different colors or you don't need to go with different um, colors with high contrast. So, um, so this, is, this is important to consider that visual variables um, are the things that need to be defined first before we select um, a visualization technique to present our data. So let's just do a quick, quick example. Um, if I go to, this is um, the, the handout that they prepared for today's lecture. We have uh, the implementation of all of the visualizations that we present today um, in these handouts. Um, I will just run a few of them, uh, if time allows all of them um, to, to have a better sense of the techniques that we are using. Um, for the concepts that we're covering in the lecture. So let me just share the link in the chat box. Okay. Yeah, I, I let me know if you can see the link. I just I just shared the link. Okay. So here we have the bubble chart that's presenting um, in this specific bubble chart is using a real world data set. We're using CDC data published by the US government. Uh, this data set is showing um, deaths uh, caused by COVID-19 in the country starting from March, 2021 to probably five, day, five days ago, because the website usually updates the data set every um, five days. So I, I don't know if the last day is today or not. Okay, no, it's not today. It's uh, the last day of July. So in this um, data set, we have different causes of COVID death. So these causes could be like some um, health, I mean, could be related to some health histories that our patient had, or it could be just COVID-19. I mean, they come to the hospital without any uh, health issues and um, they, I mean, they pass. So this, for this the cohort of patients, we have COVID-19 as um, the main cause of the death. So um, 
here we are using Altair. I included all the packages on the top. Altair is a visualization package in Python. That's, um, it's a grammar-based um, visualization technique. Um, let me just find the, find the spelling here, yes. So Altair um, is a grammar-based visualization technique. It has both uh, interactive and static versions. Um, it's very, very useful for uh, visualizing data intensive applications because um, the, the structure of um, the, the, the package, the library, or let's say the backend part of uh, all of these visualizations is mostly JSON based, is grammar based. Is, I mean, it's very scalable and flexible when it comes to um, heavy data sets or data sets that have lots of parameters to um, include in the visualization. So we're using, um, we're using a, a bubble chart here to show the mapping between the age range and different conditions that will cause to COVID death. And the visual variables we are using here are color, coordinate, and size. So here we have, if they like, for example, if uh, we, there are more deaths associated with each of these pairs, the size of the circle is bigger. Uh, the color of the, the square that's showing this mapping is darker and uh, the coordinate also is showing the mapping between the categories that we have in this data set. So um, you can, you can um, just play with this visualization and let me know if you have any questions during the presentation. So. Uh, the only things that we needed to consider here when we wanted to set up this visualization were what's the type of the data I have categorical? What's the main message that they want to communicate? I want to see uh, what's the main cause of death mapped to each of the age ranges. And, um, and I wanted to make this highlighted, make, I mean, stress on the numbers or the quantities here. So we're just using two different visual variables. You could just drop one of these. You could drop size or color, because uh, one of these, I mean, either of these presenting the message that we want to communicate. So um, the next um, slide would be on the mapping between different data types and visualization. Uh, not techniques, visual variables or visual encodings. So we usually work with these uh, three data types, main three data types, quantitative data types, um, usually continuous or discrete numbers that we have in our data sets, ordinal data sets or data types in which um, the order is important, usually uh, time or temporal data sets are good examples of ordinal data sets and nominal in which uh, we, we don't care about um, the, the quantity or how big are the numbers or the order of the values that we have in our data set. We, we, can, we can just call them categorical data. So for visual variables that we just explained, I mean, there are some other visual variables that you can see here, um, but uh, we see uh, a ranking of variables that are uh, the best visual variable to present each of these um, data types. For example, position seems to be the best one or the most effective variable for um, all of these data types. Um, we can say this is 100% true in all scenarios, but uh, this mostly comes from experience and there have been lots of research in this concept of mapping between visual variables and different data types. But if you look at, um, and, and when we go down to this list, um, um, I mean, it gets worse. So we, I mean, it's not a good idea to use shape, for example, or texture to show quantitative data. And by texture, we mean like um, in older version of Microsoft Words or Excel we had, or it's still we have like uh, uh, those options when, when it comes to data visualization, the bubbles that we put in, um, the bars of our bar chart, or we use stars, circles, dots inside um, each bar of the visualization. So these are not necessary. We are presenting quantitative data. And as long as you send a message, that should be fine. And this might just um, like make the visualization messy and they can hide uh, 
the actual takeaway that you want to communicate. So I'll go see some examples about these um, uh, like mistakes um, when it comes to visualizing different types of data sets. So looking at uh, these rankings, we see angle or slope are not, I mean, they're not the best candidates for almost all of these data types. For quantitative, it's they're ranked like in the third and fourth place. And for ordinal and nominal, it's simply not best visual uh, variable. So one reason, let's just look at a simple, simple example to show why. So there have been lots of research on the cognitive aspects of using each of these visual variables to show different data types. And it seems that human brain has a hard time to absorb or to digest uh, the mapping between values and angles. So looking at this simple visualization, we have two cohorts of patients um, and we have four different configurations. Let's say we have four different configs or we have um, four different, let's say, comorbidities in our data set. And we want to see the proportion of each of these uh, mapped to each of these cohorts of patients. It's very hard to do the comparison here. The numbers are different for sure. But um, if you put something like this in your research paper and start talking about, um, I'm sorry, yeah, and start talking about the comparisons between uh, these values, uh, the users or the readers of your work who have a hard time to understand, I can't see any difference. Is the figure that's lying or is the text that, that doesn't seem to be correct? But if you just go with a simple, simple bar chart, you can simply see um, all of these numbers and um, uh, like differences in a simple visualization. So sometimes I hear that people say, don't use a bar chart, bar chart is simple, just let's go with a more fancy visualization. But sometimes bar chart with a simple, simple length variable. You, you, I mean, in this context, we needed to have different colors, but sometimes you can just go with bar chart with uh, simple, I mean, one color. Um, it, it's the most, I mean, it can be the most effective visualization technique. So it's true that it's important. I mean, it's good to have beautiful designs, but um, before having beautiful designs, the most important um, thing that we need to consider is the visualization should be clear and revealing. It, it's not just about how fancy is the visualization. Um, so there are lots of um, mistakes um, that we see in publications um, that come from data visualization. I mean, they, they usually come from the application of visual variables that we use in our visualization techniques. So let's just start with misleading information due to size violation. Um, we have this bar chart here. Uh, let me just pause here for a second, go to our Collab notebook. I would like to ask the audience here that what's wrong with this visualization or do you see any problem with this visualization? Let me just give you some context. Here we have different models, let's say machine learning models. We have different cohorts of patients and we want to see how many patients coming from each of these cohorts are misclassified by each of these models. So can we see any problem or if you see something like this in a paper, what would be the main, um, let's say, problem that you see with this visualization? So we have the models, the y-axis is presenting the number of patients, the labels in the bar charts presenting the percentage of patients and colors presenting um, different cohorts of patients that we have in our data set. 
So this visualization, I mean, if you just reading a paper, the visualization itself looks very nice. It's clean, it has colors, the font is readable. Uh, both uh, Y and X axis have a label. We have a legion, the color contrast seems to be fine. But the problem here is the length or the size is not used properly to communicate the message. So we, here we have 36 percent is higher than 40. I mean, that the size seems to be bigger than 42 percent or 20 percent and 22 percent seems to be equal in terms of the size. 33 percent is seems to be bigger than 36 percent for the size. And also when it comes to the other categories here, it's a little bit hard to do the comparisons because we have a stacked presentation of the data and we don't have a baseline to be able to have like a more concrete uh, comparison between these sets. So let's do some corrections or let's, let's improve this visualization to make it more understandable or um, to tailor uh, the message that we want to communicate based on the context that we have in our results. Um, after extracting or taking out the normalized part, so here we are presenting two concepts, percentage and count. So let's just separate these two concepts. Uh, we say, okay, I just go with normalized uh, presentation of the data. Now 46%, 42% that they had in the top has the biggest size and the size, all sizes look to be fine. You show these to your, um, users or your co-authors and they say, I still want to see the count. So the count is important for me and the total count also is important for me. Uh, I want to see how many patients are misclassified by model one, how many patients are misclassified by model two. I mean, it's true that the having the numbers map to each of the categories is important, but the total number also is super important for us. So we we can modify the visualization again. We can go with nested bar charts. Bar chart, simple, simple visualization to show this information. So we have a bar chart that shows uh, the total number of patients. And we have some internal bars that present the value of each of these um, cohorts for each of the models. So here you can do the comparison between the red bars and the, the white bar in model one. You can do the comparison between the red bar and red bar in model one and model two. We have a baseline to do the comparisons. We can do a comparison between the total values, but still you might say, I want to have all of them in one figure. I mean, there is always a solution to do that. You can have, you can go with mixed figures or you can have parts A, parts B. So in this visualization, we have the percentage, we have the total values, and we have um, the actual count of um, the uh, patients in each of the cohorts that we have here mapped to different models. So if you go back to our default visualization, um, we can see that having or converting these to a multi-component visualization using just simple, simple visual variables is like communicating the main takeaway that we wanted to communicate with our end users. And size um, distortion or size violation is a very common mistake. More than half of um, the papers that had some visual visualization issues, they were tied with size issues. For example, these circles are presenting um, the values of 10, 15, 20, 30, and the top or the black circles presenting these values based on the area of the circle, the red ones presenting the values based on the radius of the circle. So if we go with this size presentation, it seems to be a huge difference between the value of the small one and the third one. But um, they are almost, I mean, they are very close to each other. So it's always, um, and, and, and if you just show uh, the figure to your users and if they just want to um, kind of digest that main message or that main takeaway based on the visualization, they might have this impression that, oh, this category had less errors or this category had less number of patients. Same with, um, 
like the other types of um, size adjustments. For example, here, the, the range of values that we want to present in the black bars or in this data set is 80 to 100. Uh, but if you want to adjust um, the range and say, okay, we're starting from 80, let's just um, change the scale of the axis, Y axis to let's say 75. So here we see lots of differences or diversity in the values um, in our data set, but this is the actual distribution that we have in our data. So, so these are the things that we need to be careful about when we use visual variables and visualization techniques um, to show our um, the results of our data or um, like um, to communicate our uh, message with the users, readers, or uh, the audience of our work. So misleading information due to color violation is another topic uh, that's, that I thought it's a must have for this talk because um, color is a key component in information visualization, and it can be used as a label, it can be used um, as a measurement, you can use color to represent a concept, or it can be just a concept, uh, I mean, a tool to make your visualizations more beautiful. But um, color needs to be applied to serve a purpose. It must be clear and it must not distract. So you cannot just use color to have color in your visualization. So the last example that we have here uh, is, I, I mean, I just made a mock-up data set to show um, a good scenario for this application. Uh, we have, let's say we have different features in our machine learning model. And we want to see what's the contribution of each of these features to the final performance. You just use a simple, simple bar chart and you say, okay, let's just add colors to different bars. So we have different categories and we know that color is a very good technique for categorical data. Uh, let's just go with like a nice color palette. So this is not a nice color palette. This is the default color palette um, that's usually used by ggplot in R. But um, regardless of the palette that we're using here, co color is not required here. I mean, we're talking about the values or the, the, the number that, that's presenting the contribution. Um, but we can, I mean, if, if there is a need to add color, there should be a purpose for that. For example, you might want to say, what are the features that contributing the most or what are the features that contributing the least? So uh, this is a correction, um, the above visualization that's just removing color from everything. And it's just adding color to the most important or most important features or the features uh, that the contribution is less than 10%. So let's just um, run this code again to see another variation of this chart and see if we can see least contributing. Yes, so now we have uh, some specific features highlighted in this visualization. There is no need to have more than two colors for this specific um, visualization for this specific concept I and mean, context. Uh, so yeah, so we have, uh, this is, I mean, th there are some examples in the presentation that you can see uh, later. Uh, and all of these examples that have a code um, um, in the collab um, are annotated by this, by the collab logo and the example hyperlink. So color should be used when it's important. We just had a good example. And this is another um, super interesting um, typical example of the value of color when it's needed. For example, we want to count the sevens, number of sevens in our um, visualization. Um, so the first one, it's almost impossible or very, very time consuming to count the sevens. For the second one, it seems to be very easy. Uh, I mean, um, the text itself is um, very flat, which might makes it hard to, to keep track of the counting. But in general, this is a very useful way to highlight the things that you want to show and communicate with your users. And 
we are using color again here, but uh, another thing that's important that, and, and will open, um, or I mean, can be used as a good um, bridge to our next concept for um, color palettes is the color contrast. So here we have different color, but the contrast is not good enough. I mean, for some people, it might be hard to differentiate between dark brown and black, and you might have a hard time or you might miss some of these sevens when you're counting um, the numbers. So, um, so now we talk about the value of the colors and the importance of colors when it comes to information visualization. Colors can be misused because um, they are not presenting a norm. For example, here we are showing different cohort of patients and each patient, or there is a score, a severity score that's assigned to each patient in each of these cohorts. So I want to see the distribution of patients based on the severity level for each of these cohorts. Um, if people with this color palette, when I look at this, I say, oh, um, it seems cohort seven and cohort four are doing great in terms of, I mean, number of patients with severity level because the blue bump is much, much bigger than the other parts. Uh, or we can say poor cohort four or cohort nine because they have like a big red part in um, their distribution. But um, this, the color palette we are using here, it's not um, a norm. We usually use blue for better concepts, red for uh, negative concepts. And, um, and um, I mean, regardless of the blue, red, this is, uh, we'll see shortly that this is not um, a nice or um, efficient color palette. Rainbow color palettes usually are not the best. Um, way to present data when you have different distributions in your data. So we can just simply, I mean, they, they, I mean, you did all the effort to do to make this nice visualization. The only thing you need to do is just change just a statement or a string in your code. Go with a color palette that uh, implies uh, the um, the situation, or if, if it comes to decision making based on the results of your study, you know that you need to stress on cohort four and cohort seven, for example, because they have more dark purple or they have more red um, distribution because of um, the number of patients with a higher severity level. Going back to our color concepts, um, colors should not harm. Um, looking at these texts that we have here, color encoding, the first one is almost impossible to read or at least is very, very hard to read. There is no need to have these colors here. Uh, we're just talking about color encoding. The second one is much, much better. It's using two colors, but the frame, the color of the frame and the encoding are the same. I would ask myself, is there any reason? Is there any mapping between, I mean, why, why encoding the color of this part of the text is same as the color of uh, the borders? The second one has different, um, I mean, just one color for the text, the border color is different. And you might say, okay, if this is fine because they wanted to highlight the text. Um, and the third one, uh, we see only one color. Again, depending on the context, um, I, I would say either of these is fine, but um, um, we see the differences between these two um, application of um, color coding here because the, the second to last one is more highlighted and it's more bold because we're using different color or we have a different color contrast between just the text and the border. I mean, this simple, simple, um, like change can make a huge difference in terms of understandability or legibility of uh, a visualization. So the other thing is make all your readers happy. So around 300 million people worldwide have some level of color blindness. And um, when you make a visualization, um, we will need to consider those readers too. So if you publish your paper 
and 500 people based on this number and 500 people will read your paper, 24 of those people have color blindness or color weakness. Uh, we have different types of color blindness um, that uh, we see here. I mean, this is weakness, but we'll see in the next slide that um, there are different categories of um, color blindness. So um, this is the visualization that normal vision or people with a normal vision can see, but you see the lines are not that clear when it comes to red color weakness or green color weakness or blue color weakness looks a little bit better. But when it comes to color blindness, um, it's completely different. Um, two to three percent, um, almost two to three percent of people in the world are color blind. And looking at these pictures, it's almost, um, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's very hard to differentiate between the colors that we're using in this visualization here. Or, um, or let's let's just do um, another example. So, if you use, for example, the left side color palette, red and green blind people cannot tell red, green, and brown apart. So, if you use these colors in your visualization, these are the things that they will see. And if you say red color or you highlight the main message of your work with red and uh, you stress on that throughout your manuscript, they might have a hard time to follow your um, work or to follow the main message of your work. And same for red and green blind people. Um, they, they have a hard time to differentiate between these colors. And if you use this color palette, these are the things that they will see um, in your visualization. So. When it comes to messy, messy visualizations, you use lots of colors to show your data. This is what they see. So it's almost impossible to, to get your message. And um, sometimes you, you use, you put lots of effort on making the results um, and your paper might not get enough attention. The reason could be you're not communicating the messages properly. And, especially in the field of data science um, and AI that we work with data, the best way, I mean, we are doing art to, uh, to analyze that data and add insight to the data. So um, part of this art is presenting the data in a way or the results in a way that's clear for everyone and everyone can understand it. You never, when you look at an art piece, I mean, um, like an artifact, um, it's it's usually easy to to um, understand the work and visualization uh, mapped to heavy heavy data analysis results also should do the same. Um, it's not just about how beautiful is the chart. Um, it should be clear and uh, it it should really serve a purpose. Uh, so there are different tools that you can use to make sure that uh, your visualization, the colors you use in your visualizations are color blind friendly or color weakness friendly. These are amazing, amazing tools. Um, I wish I could go through some of them um, like in a live session, but uh, we might go over time. So I would just leave this here, uh, but you can refer to this later after the talk and when you have access to, to the slides. So you can just upload your visualization to these tools and it will show you that how colorblind people will see your chart. And if it's a still clear, yeah, uh, you can you can use those color palettes in your chart. Otherwise it might be better to go with a different color palette. So we have different color scales. Uh, this is very, very important when it comes to selecting a color or choosing any efficient color palette for your visualization. So we have sequential diverging and qualitative color palettes. In sequential color palettes, or let's say um, sequential scale is mainly used for sequential data or the data that has a range, it changes from low to high. And um, some, some good examples could be the age range or the accuracy or uh, the severity of the patient. So we have a range of values and high is different from the law. So we have diverging color palette or color scale. Here we don't um, like care about which one is first one, which one is last one. Both 
sides of the spectrum are important for us. And we have a middle part that uh, shows like if the flat area in our data analysis. So we'll see a very, very good example of this um, color sequence shortly. And qualitative color palettes or scales are used to show categorical data. The value is not important. If you see this is pink, this is green, it doesn't mean that the value of pink is higher than or lower than uh, green and vice versa. So we use qualitative um, color scales to show um, categorical data. So be very, very careful. If you're using this color palette to show different cohorts of patients, and I look at your visualization and I, I might ask myself, what's changing here? So why I, I have light pink, dark pink, and almost a black pink, uh, but you, you just wanted to show different cohorts of patients, but you use a wrong color scale. We use sequential data when it's important for us that the darker one um, like is present, I mean, we, we differentiate between the dark and light uh, sides of the spectrum, but uh, for categorical data, we don't care, but you just need to be careful about uh, the contrast between the colors for some specific context, like when you use um, qualitative colors to show race, ethnicity, we need to be super careful about our choices uh, for huge data sets when you have lots of categories, it's good to be careful about the colors that you choose because the contrast between the colors is very important. Sometimes you have a very, very um, imbalanced data set. Some parts of your bar chart or the visualization are super, super tiny. So you can't have like these two gray and brownish or gold colors next to each other because there is no contrast between these colors. So these are the things that uh, you, we will need to still consider when it comes to qualitative data. It's true that um, we don't care about the context. It's just different colors presenting different categories, but uh, still are things that we need to consider. So the other thing um, that they would like to mention about using color is uh, um, adding or like uh, dividing continuous data or splitting them into different beans um, in a way to have an effective uh, way to define a color scale or map the data to uh, an effective color scale for uh, visualization purposes. So going back to our um, tutorial here, we have um, two different uh, parameters, or let's say we have lab tests or we have um, two um, values that are collected for our patients. And we want to see, uh, let's say blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, I mean, the numbers might not imply those values because this is a mock-up data so they just made here. But uh, we want to see what are like the values that mostly come together or can we see a pattern in, the, in this data set? It might be hard to have like all of these values one by one, if, if the data is ranging from zero to 150, it's, it's very hard to have 150 uh, ticks in your visualization for each of the axes that you have here. So we bin the data, for example, here I say, I want 30 bins, divide the data into bins. So now I can go with a very, very effective sequential um, color scale to show the data. And Uh, the other thing that um, we need to consider to avoid misleading information is the purpose of the visualization. So we do data visualization to add insight, not just to make some pictures. So this is um, a good example that we have it also in our tutorial on Colab. So we want to see the contribution of different features to the performance of different models for different configurations, or let's say parameters, um, and we want to see for each of these configs, how each of these features are contributing to the performance of our models. Um, so one way would be just going with a bar chart and you say, okay, I have for each feature, I have a single bar chart. I would call it a group bar chart because uh, each class of bars or each pack of or group of bars is presenting um, one model and um, each 
color food bar in for each model is presenting a different cohort of patients. So going to our tutorial here, um, we have, um, again, we have a mock-up data for this. This is not coming from a real world data set, but let's just run it again here. So this is hard to interpret. First reason, we have lots of things to communicate here. The second thing, I want to compare the contribution of feature two for config one between model one and let's say model two. I mean, your eye needs to move a lot in this visualization to do the comparison. So you say, I, I will change the config of the visualization instead of dividing them by um, the, 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 the features, I would divide them by the models. So now, sorry, instead of dividing them or grouping them based on the cohorts, you group them based on the models. You say, okay, this might be easier. So now I might ask another question uh, that would be very hard to answer with these new configurations of the, of the visualization. So here is a place that you say, okay, what are the concepts that they want to communicate and what are the visual variables that they can use? We have different categories in this data. So if you go to the code, we have the models as categories. We have the configs and we have the features. Can I just use coordinates to just use a simple, simple coordinate to show the mapping between features and models and for different configs, again, can I use coordinate or size or slope or angle or color to, to show the differences between the values? So this alternative visualization, which is called Comet Card, Comet Plot, for example, is a very, very nice um, technique. And it's a good alternative for the bar charts that we had in the top. So we have coordinates that's used to map models and the features that we have here. I'm talking about feature one and model one. Do whatever comparisons they want to do here in terms of these two concepts or these two categories in your data set. And we are using size. So if the performance is increasing, the size also is increasing. If it's decreasing, the size also is decreasing. And here, the palette that we see here, it's a diverging palette. Both sides of this color palette are super important for us. We want to see where are or what are the combinations that we have a huge increase or a huge decrease. I can, by just looking at this chart, I can simply say that for this feature, for model three, um, we had uh, we had an increase. I mean, I can see the blue, blue here. Uh, I can see a few, blue-ish or close to blue in the other areas. I see a red here. So this is also a sign that we had some decrease here. And the rest of the chart are presenting the colors coming from the middle of this um, scale, color scale. So in diverging color scales, you can, you can find the parts of your data or the parts of your results that do not need too much attention, or they can show the highlighting parts or they can show the highlighting patterns of your data set. So it was super hard to come up with these um, like conclusions by just looking at these uh, simple, simple bar charts. So going back to the rest of um, the lecture, so we already covered these, um, misinformation can be due to data volume. So look at this line chart. It's almost impossible to track the things. Um, and sometimes more is less. I mean, in this specific visualization, um, we're adding more lines, more concepts, but we're getting less concepts. Uh, this is another nice visualization technique that they put in um, the tutorial. So I will go through this quickly just to make sure that we can um, finish on time. But this is stream chart um, that shows the, the um, evolution of values over time. And this stream chart here is showing the number of COVID deaths um, 
in the United States starting from the first month, I mean, the first case or the time the first case was detected until five days ago. So looking at this pattern, you might say, oh, there were lots of deaths in the country or the country did a poor job around this time or around this time. But we have too much data to visualize here. Don't um, like use aggregate visualizations to communicate decisions or messages that can present the quality or um, an effort or something that, that um, is kind of um, 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 hiding some critical information in your data. If I, if I just present the Alabama's data, yes, this is very close. But if I go to Massachusetts, this is different. So I, I don't see the same exact same pattern here. So aggregate data sometimes can hide information and be careful about those when you use area chart or when you use um, like uh, other types of aggregate data. So going back to our um, ranking of visual variables, um, we can um, also talk about uh, using, I mean, um, uh, Samir gave a very nice overview of overview figures in papers, uh, but we still need to consider those visual variables when it comes to designing uh, just simple, simple figures or over overview figures. So there are four rule of thumb, thumbs that we need to consider. Define the goals. Are you presenting a process or are you just presenting a structure? So there is a difference between making an overview visualization for overview figure for process versus data structure or use consistent design elements, highlight the key points. So here in this simple like, diagram, we are showing a process, but for all of them, we are using icons, for example, to show the visual. I'm not using an actual uh, figure or a, a picture for one part of this visualization and an icon uh, for presenting other parts. It's always good to have consistency between different parts um, for example, this is also showing showing like a process, but it's very hard to follow the input, output, um, the value or the stress on different parts of this process. Um, if you're using presenting the process or data flow, data or process from left to right or top to bottom. Um, for example, this visualization here is showing an iterative process. It not only presenting the process, also it's showing the, the, the nature of the process, that this is something that is iterative. And also use legends for your figures if it's required. Um, sometimes users might have a hard time to understand some of the concepts they're using in your overview figures or the figures they use to present your um, process. So there are other visualization techniques that I wish um, I could go through them in this talk, but um, we are three minutes to 5 p.m. And um, I would just stop here and um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any questions. Sarah, thank you for the wonderful presentation and walkthrough of how to create high quality plots and charts. Uh, this was super awesome.